You are listening to Radio Maria Canada. We now present the Health Hub, hosted by Kathy Biasi. Welcome to the Health Hub. I am Kathy Biasa, your host, and on behalf of everyone here at Radio Maria Canada, I'd like to thank you for taking a part of your day to be with us. Today's show is being recorded, so there is no opportunity, unfortunately, for calling in, but you can keep up to date with everything that's going on at Radio Maria Canada and keep in touch with us by following us on our social sites. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and we are at the Health Hub RMC on all locations. And do feel free to email us at thh at radiomaria.ca. Please subscribe to our podcast. We are the Health Hub on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, all of your favorite podcast platforms. And you can also find our podcast directly on the Radio Maria Canada website, which is radiomaria.ca, and on my website, which is kathybiasse.com. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, and while most of us experienced it from the periphery, our guest today, Kushel Choksi, was there, and his experience changed the course of his life. Kushel started his career as a quantitative analyst with Goldman Sachs. He left his position as vice president of asset management there to join Athlon, an investment fund. As a managing director of Athlon, he helped ramp up a $45 billion portfolio before the fund was acquired by EBF Associates. He then moved to India to join BlackRock's fixed income business as a senior vice president, where he managed billions of dollars in the company's flagship mutual funds. After returning to New York, he submitted to his passion for entrepreneurship and started his own tech startup. His content distribution venture Hubble was acquired by Airpush within two years. He then started a proprietary trading venture, Cavallino Capital, which later merged with ARB Trading Group. He and his wife now run Elements Truffles, a New York-based artisanal chocolate company built on the values of Ayurveda, sustainability, giving back, and ethical trade. Kushel is a trainer of personal development, meditation, wellness, and leadership programs for the Art of Living Foundation. He has taught secrets of breathwork and meditation to thousands across U.S., Europe, and Asia. He serves on the U.S. Board of International Association for Human Values, IAHV. His story is a compelling one, and it's an interview that I'm sure that you will all enjoy and find great value in. We talk about a number of things, including why sometimes we need to look inwards for our answers. We talk about the art and the science of breathwork and using the practice of meditation to focus and sharpen our purpose. It's an interview, as I said, I think you will really enjoy. So I do hope you stay with us. We will be back in a few minutes to talk to Kushel Choksi.
Are listening to Radio Maria Canada. We now continue with the program, The Health Hub, hosted by Kathy Biasi. Welcome back, everybody. As mentioned, this is being recorded, so no opportunity for calling in. Please do follow us on our social sites. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and we are at the Health Hub RMC in all locations. Kushal, thank you for joining us. I have been looking forward to this interview. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for having me. I know with a book tour, you're pulled in many directions, and I, I do appreciate you taking time to be with us. It's, it's a great honor for us to have you with us here. Absolutely. Likewise. Now, in the introduction, everybody learned about you and your wonderful business successes, and um, it's great insight into your career. It gives us a great perspective. Um, it also gives us a great understanding how how successful you have been. And you've had great transition within your career. How has the, um, the events of 9-11, the experience of being there at 9-11, impacted the direction of not just your career, but of your life? How has that, how has that borne onto how you're living your life now? You know, 9-11 was one of those page turner events in my life. One that, that flipped the rudder um, of, my, of my singularly monochromatic journey, if, if you will. Um, I was so much engrossed in pursuing that proverbial American dream uh, as I had started working on, on Wall Street here uh, just before 9-11. Um, that I was perhaps sucked into it, in, into that flow of um, blinding capitalism at some point in time. And it was so strong that I'd even perhaps stopped asking what I was doing, why I was doing. Uh, it just felt right in that moment. And when uh, this whole September 11 happened and um, I, ha- I had a miraculous escape, um, a very near uh, encounter with death, it kind of shook me up, uh, sort of woke me up from my, from my reverie. And that was the first time I perhaps asked myself what I was doing or why I was doing what I was doing. I very distinctly remember the days that followed after 9-11. I had this very interesting dichotomy in my head where a part of me was very grateful uh, feeling fortunate, f- feeling enthusiastic about the the new lease on life, and I wanted to go out there and and finish uh, the unfinished business, if you will, sort of go after um, all that I had set out to do with even more energy, um, thinking that you know time was limited, and and um, here I had some sort of a second chance to go after it. On the other side there was this distinct feeling of disinterest. There was this 
um, sort of apathy towards life. I had this feeling that what's the point of this anyways? What if I'm, I'm, I go after that with even more energy and more gusto and something like this could happen again. It was, it felt so fragile. And what if I'm not so fortunate the next time around? Um, what do I do then? Um, so what's the point of this? I mean, I, I, in that moment, I began questioning the, the, the status quo. Um, and it, I, I remember feeling again and again that there had to be more to life than just this, this rat race, this, this blind chase that I was, I was completely engulfed in. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, this was kind of the conflict that was, that was raging in my mind um, around and after 9-11, that kind of pushed me to, to ask bigger questions. Were you happy in your life before 9-11, pre-9-11? I would certainly think so. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I was thriving. Um, I felt, um, you know, I was living the dream. I was um, rising pretty fast in the corporate uh, career. I, I loved what I was doing. Um, I was in a great relationship. Um, I was living in New York City. So I, all these parameters or all these check marks that I had set up for myself which I thought would define happiness, they were all met. So in, in a way, in a sense, yes, I was, I was um, kind of on the track to, to get where I thought I wanted to be. You called it a monochromatic journey. It's a, that's a quite a descriptive uh, word for it. And, you know, I, when listening to you, I've had things that have sort of given me a knee jerk and I've gone completely left of, of my direction And I'm wondering if events like this are just a quicker entrance into a path that we may be going down anyways. What I'm getting at is, do you feel that you may have evolved into going down a more introspective pathway eventually? Perhaps. There's no way for me to say definitively. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a completely parallel universe that, that I never embarked upon. Um, but, but it, it would not have been in, in the same, um, at the same rate, uh, perhaps an event like this accelerated my journey. Um, I would have, you know, my journey started with, uh, breath work and meditation. And I remember back then when I was being introduced to it, I always felt it was something when I, uh, when I'm retired, when, when I'm done with all my quote unquote, worldly responsibilities, that's when I take on to those um, ethereal pursuits. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I have no way to say I would have how far or how quickly I would have gotten there. But while there was a seed, while there was a curiosity about these things, I definitely, definitely not, was not ready for it in that moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I was so consumed by what I was doing and, and, a high pressure New York life that, that, you know, it doesn't make it easier. It doesn't even let you go there. Uh, especially when you're constantly surrounded by that, you know, high octane lifestyle mm-hmm. where, you know, your bar is constantly being raised on you. Um, you. I constantly found myself, you know, trying to meet those expectations. Um, and, and so perhaps I would have gotten there, but <laughs> it would have been a very, very delayed response. A longer uh, perhaps journey when I would have you. burnt out or when I would have, I couldn't have taken it any longer and said, oh, you know, here I have hit a midlife crisis and I need to find something else. Yeah, I, It would definitely not have happened in my 20s. Not in your 20s. And how, how was it in your 20s that this happened? Yes. It yes. was. So that is quite early because life is an evolution, right? We learn, we succeed, we grasp for different things. We have time. So when this something like this is thrust upon you at the age of 20, that is, that is quite young. And did you, you know, was the impact a mental one? Did you have some sort of a break or was it just you step back and you thought your way through this and you sought out pathways to get you where you thought you might need to go? It was emotional one. I cannot deny that. You know, there was, um, it, it started initially with this whole feeling of being, you know, kind of withdrawing in. Uh, for the longest time, I would not talk about it to anyone. Uh, if somebody would ask me, hey, how did you, it was an 
you know, natural question, how did you come out of it? How did you survive? And I would, I would just paint a very simplistic version of, of my whole escape. And, and I would just say, yeah, that happened. Uh, aren't you happy I'm here? And, and just skillfully switch the topics or, or change the context of conversation. Um, but what was very clear in my mind that I was, I was pushing away. I was, um, you know, I did not want to go there. I, I was avoiding being with that feeling of void. I was avoiding uh, being with that feeling of discomfort. Um, and in that process, I even remember kind of distracting myself. You know, I, I, I not only avoided um, people or, or conversations, I, I started going out and doing crazy things in terms of like I would go travel the world, follow some adventures, um, thinking that that would take me out of that, that funk of mind. That would perhaps take me out of that feeling of disinterest. And, you know, every time I would do that, it would prove to be a little distraction. Um, on a professional front, I thought, hey, perhaps I need to quit this 905 and, and well, it was a nine to nine, but I had to quit, quit that and, and, and do a startup. You know, that's, that's cool. Um, so I quit that a promising Wall Street career and, and joined a, a startup, thinking that that would fulfill that void that I was feeling. Right? But all these were proving out to be you know, ephemeral distractions. I would go there, enjoy it for a few minutes or a few moments, hours, days, and then come back to that same state of, of uh, void, if you will. Would you call and, it a trauma, a PTSD? You know, at that point of time, I was not even aware there would be a PTSD, but yeah, there were definitely some telltale signs of it. You know, mm -hmm. I would hear a loud noise or every time I would remove my shoes at the airport, um, it, it, it would take me back to that, that morning. Absolutely. Um, it's completely understandable. Right. So um, truth be told, Kathy, I, I, I did not know any better. This is, um, again, early, early 2000s. There's not enough awareness about it. Um, nobody's talking about these things. Of course, there was, you know, um, th there was help available, but I, I just thought, you know, I'm a, I'm a resilient New Yorker. I think I can handle it by myself. I'm, I'm pretty strong and I just need to pick up myself, wear it like a badge of honor and, and move through it, plow through it because, you know, life was too short to, to be um, kind of giving in to, to mm -hmm. these kind of uh, things that your mind is feeling. So, I have to think you must have had thoughts of, you know, why am I here versus why am I, you know, not here? I, I, you're a cerebral person, a very intelligent person. And all of these emotions must have been tightly wound up inside you for quite a while. They absolutely were. They absolutely were. But and, and funny thing is, I did not know how to how to deal with them. Um, for the longest time, I, I did all these things just to avoid them. The only mm -hmm. way I knew to deal with them was by avoiding them. Mm -hmm. um, there was no real constructive way to address the, the root cause. All I knew was to just deal with the symptoms. So what broke things open for you? What really turned the corner was this practice of breath work. The first experience of meditation and my foray into this whole new science of going inwards opened or made manifest by the sky breath meditation, the, the technique that I learned. Um, and it all happened in a very funny way. I was very reluctant to, to this whole, if you will, quote unquote, alternative way of dealing with things. Um, I was a science first mindset. Hey, show me the data, show me the proof, then I'll, I'll believe you. Um, and, and some of these things, you know, there's an experience first and, and, and proof later, right? So, um, so I kind of avoided those things. You know, I, um, I was reading things along. I, was, I read up a lot of books on how to deal with these things. There was a lot of, there were, and I encountered a lot of spiritual books, a lot of books that talk about breath work and, and meditation. But it, those experiences cannot be imparted through a book, which, of course, I did not appreciate in, in those moments. So when someone said that there is a, there's a spiritual master, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, who was traveling, he says, you go, you know, let's 
go there, let's meditate with him. I was like, no, I don't need it. You know, I'm, 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 I'm completely happy. Look, I'm thriving. Can't you see? I, I don't need all this stuff. But somehow I ended up there. And then the first time I experienced meditation and the first time I experienced that moment of mindfulness, it was a head space without any thoughts, uh, something I'd never, ever, ever experienced before. And I really enjoyed that feeling. I enjoyed that, that, that moment of calm and, and sort of a pause. But again, that, that validation seeking mind was popping up thinking, are you sure this is really it? Or are you sure you didn't sleep off? Are you sure this is not some sort of placebo? Um, And so I, I, I went deeper into it looking for some scientific validation. And when I, found some proof and I found how actually it worked, uh, both corroborated by science and the other, on the other hand, the, the tangible irrefutable experience, I felt very empowered. In that moment, I thought there's something in here which I want to go deeper into and, and, and perhaps explore what are the doors it can open up in my journey. Did you find that in this mindfulness space, you were face to face with some of these emotions that you had to push through? Wow. You hit it on the head. This was the the very first experience when I learned the sky breath technique. Um, It's basically a a breathing technique. You just, you know, in simple words, you sit and breathe. And I, I thought it would be very similar to my experience of meditating for the first time. Um, I thought I would immediately feel that space without thoughts. I would feel that, that calm, but it turned out to be exactly the opposite. When I started breathing, um, all these memories, all these impressions, all these experiences that I had kind of shoved under the carpet for the longest time, out of nowhere, they just came, that storm arose like that. And I felt like being in the eye of the storm, sitting and breathing while everything is just swirling around me. And it was a very, um, I don't even know how to explain that, that, that experience. I don't even have words for it, but it was a mixed feeling of kind of enjoying something, which, you know, it's very difficult in, in, in the beginning, but it leads to a, a very calm state. So all these things came up and then it was just as if it was leaving me. It was just coming up and rising up and, and then, then getting sucked out of the system. And when that, that, that technique, that process ended, I felt that, that feeling of calm, that feeling of lightness um, that I never experienced before. And that and perhaps was, closure, was the- Closure on the emotional um, journey that you'd been on? Perhaps too early to say it was a closure, but definitely, definitely an opening, definitely um, a a segue into a path, a segue into a way that would help deal with me and and infuse that uh, renewed sense of enthusiasm, if you will, the renewed sense of... um, kind of dealing with this in a much, much more positive way um, than I had known. Definitely didn't feel the need to ignore it anymore. Um, I could, it, it gave me a tool, I felt, to, to shake hand with the void rather than avoiding it. Do you feel that people need to have something impactful in their life to seek this thing out? Or do you think now that you've experienced, now that you have become very entrained in this life, do you think it's something that everybody has cause to look into? I feel my only regret with this whole thing is why I did not do this earlier. Mm -hmm. Why did I resist it when it was right in front of me? But the reason behind that is that everyone has to go through their own journey to come to that moment, to be able to ask that question that what is it that I'm doing here? Is it all to life? And 
for me, it was 9-11. Um, not everybody needs to go through such a monumental event like that. You know, the, 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 the pandemic could have, and it did again for me, so it, I'm sure it did for many other people. It perhaps evoked the same emotions. It perhaps forced upon the same questions that one asked. It perhaps created the same, you know, strains and stresses on everyday pursuits and, and whether it's our work life, whether it's, whether it's uh, relationships, whatever it is that we're going through and taking it for granted and flowing with it, I'm sure it made people pause and ask that question. So I believe life just gives so many opportunities to, to pause and, and reflect and take stock and say, hey, what is it? Is that more than, than, than what I'm doing right now? And I think that one, one fillip, that one trigger is, I think, enough to kind of look away and, and ask yourself that question. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. We're going to take a quick break here, everybody. And when we come back, we're going to continue this great conversation. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. You are listening to The Health Hub here on Radio Maria Canada, a Catholic voice wherever you are. 
To contact us and be a part of the show, email thh at radiomaria.ca. We now continue with the program. Here once again is your host, Kathy Biasi. Welcome back, everybody. We are having a wonderful conversation here with Chriselle Chocksky, and we are going to introduce you to his book in a few minutes. But uh, let's lay the groundwork here um, as to why this book is so appropriate for everybody. Um, at the end of the last segment, we, we, you know, you brought up the topic of not just trauma um, being a reason for breath work and meditation, but how it can be used in everyday life. And you also touched just a little bit on the science about it. There'll be a lot of people there that aren't at the point where the trauma has pushed them into uh, an alternate or looking for an alternate um, being or a different path. Uh, and, and it probably the majority of people are not there, but these techniques and what you have learned are effective for business people. They are effective for moms and dads. Give us a little bit of the science that you've discovered and how you can see it being woven into everyday life. Sure. You know, often we think like how you said, we wait for a trauma, uh, like a club that that hits your head and then you just wake up and say, Hey, what is this? But if you see our lives, the way we lead our lives every day, every action, every experience or every emotion that we feel is leaving a trace on our nervous system. Of course, something as big as a nine 11 leaves a much deeper, much deeper etch, much deeper groove, but something as simple as wanting to have a dessert after every meal, it creates an impression on our nervous system, on our subconscious. You want a dessert today, tomorrow again, you, you, you remember the experience from yesterday, so you want again another ice cream after the meal. Now that has become a part of who you are. Third day you want it, and then the fourth day you don't have it, you feel, yeah, today's meal was just not complete. So something as innocent, as simple as wanting to have uh, a pleasant experience has created a pattern, a conditioning in our being, in our nervous system. And whether you are a mom, whether you are somebody, you know, in a, in a, in a professional setting, um, whether you are an entrepreneur, our life starts getting governed by these impressions or this conditioning of our own mind. Everything we do, every, whatever we, however we show up, whether we are talking to our kids, whether we are talking to, um, you know, how we're responding to our, our colleagues, we respond in a way that our patterns govern it. Our thinking kind of gets pigeonholed. Our thinking kind of gets in a rut because of these patterns. And what this sky breath, what this breath work does that I learned is it relieves these impressions from your nervous system. It, through the repetitive act of breath work, it, clean, it cleanses our nervous system of these impressions. And when, when you're free from these impressions, of course, the memories are still there, but they have no charge on you. The, the negative charge disappears. And when you're in that space, you know, the, your intuition improves, your, the way you show up for others improve, the, your energy levels improve, your focus improves. You know, every part of your function on day-to-day -day life improves. You know, we have all these physical functions. We have emotional functions. We have cognitive functions. We have perception, you know, we have functions of perception, thinking, judgment, memory. There, there's a certain rhythm in all these. And we struggle. We, our perception get, gets jaded when these functions go out of rhythm. So what this practice does is it brings them back in rhythm. It's very simple. It just aligns yourself with the nature. You know how there's rhythm in nature, like seasons come and go, you know, sun rises and sets. Everything follows a certain rhythm. And the same rhythm is, is entrenched in our being, in all these layers of our, our being, our self. And when we align these, all these functions, whether it's physical thinking, judgment, memory, cognition, you, when these are aligned in rhythm, you feel natural, you feel light, you feel energetic. 
And it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something I experienced. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is all I have to do is just sit and breathe. I don't have to push away thoughts, which is something I struggled with when I, in my early days of meditation, I don't have to put an effort to resist something or focus on something because I, I had problems, you know, controlling my own mind. Yeah. But here, just through breath, it, it, you just sit and breathe and it kind of magically takes care of everything else. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, I mean, I worked in finance. I traded here in Toronto. Um, and I know that uh, a lot of times you have to be aggressive, assertive, decisive, sometimes a wee bit cutthroat. Um, how does this parallel with breath work? Does, does meditation and breath work take the edge off of, um, you know, the, the hustle that you need to have if you're a business person? Have you lost your edge? In fact, it sharpens the edge. You know, um, it's, this was the, one of the biggest things that kept me away from it for a long time because, because I thought to be able to do this, you have to become a monk and, and go to a cave and meditate all day and give up on all the you know, worldly pleasures and everything that I was seeking. But in fact, it was the, exactly the opposite. Like, it just makes everything else so much more juicier. It, to, to, That's a nice word. <laughs> yeah. I mean, truth be told, this whole practice gave me the courage to follow my heart. It was only after I started learning this, it gave me that strength to, to really pursue what I always wanted to. I, since then, I had one failed and, and two successful exits from, a, from startups. You know, I, I, right now I'm doing something completely different than, than what I studied or what my family and friends would have expected me to do, uh, which I would have done if not for this for all my life, because I was sort of thinking of caring too much about people's judgments and, and opinions about myself. This so, is your artisanal chocolate company. That's my chocolate company for which I have no culinary education or, <laughs> or neither does my wife. And we just, we just do it because it, it feels right. Um, it, it makes an impact and it, it kind of makes our heart sink. Um, so yeah, it, to, to, to back to your, to your question, it's exactly the opposite. You know, I, my teacher gave me a really good example when, when I kind of asked a similar question, he said, for an, for a javelin to, to tear forward, you have to push it back. You have to pull it back mm -hmm. and then it can go forward. So it was like that. So you've achieved clarity. Definitely. One of the th things clarity. is clarity. Now, you have a, a new book that is coming out in September of this year on a wing and a prayer. Uh, the tagline is wonderful. Spirituality for the reluctant, the curious, and the seeker. Is this an autobiography? It is definitely my journey on this path, um, a journey of a left brain skeptic having stumbled upon this breath work, um, completely succumbed to the patterns of my own mind, <laughs> Um, and, and this, this, how this nine 11 shook me up and forced me to ask bigger questions, but something in my mind, whether it's my conditioning, my guards, the opinions of others kept me away from, from diving into it. So this is a journey of me as a reluctant, but a curious seeker, um, wanting to explore more and what I learned along the way and, and how it, it transformed me. And, and I feel that, you know, how it, the, one of the biggest gifts it gave me was to, to help me cultivate that sense of purpose. Um, and, and I feel that I had to write about it and, and, and share my story, my journey with, with the world. And this is your first book. This is my first book. Yes. Well, congratulations. I, honestly, I, I don't know how people can write like you write. I don't know how you can put your thoughts down on paper. I think it's such a wonderful achievement to have written a book. Who are you hoping to reach with the book? Or was this completely a cathartic project? <laughs> I think anyone and everyone who has ever had this question cross their mind that what is the point of anything that I'm doing right now? Or is, this more, is there more to life than what meets the eye? This book is for them. Forget about 9-11, forget about pandemic, forget about any triggers that have been instrumental for that. I know for sure from my experience, from, from 
people I know, my dear friends, my colleagues, we all ask, we all pause and ask this question. So what's next? But oftentimes we don't have an answer. I kind of, in, I went into a tailspin looking for that answer and somehow stumbled upon this. So I feel if I could do it, I'm sure there everybody can, can perhaps benefit that taste that, that beauty, taste this peace that we all carry with ourselves, but we are looking for its outwards. We're looking for it somewhere outside. Do you think we're perpetual seekers? Are we ever going to be satisfied? Is someone like you ever going to be satisfied or will there always be questions and movement and directional change? I think learning is ingrained in us. I think I feel I want to be a perpetual student. I want to be a perpetual seeker. Um, what keeps changing is the pursuit. Early on, I was seeking just material comfort. Now I'm seeking something that seems so magnanimous, that seems so much more than, than the limited purview of my logic or my limited understanding. Early on, I was evaluating everything from logic only to realize that logic is based on my limited understanding. It was like driving the car by looking in the rear view mirror. So I want to, now that this has opened my eyes to a much bigger kind of mysteries of our own mind, I want to, I want to, I don't want to stop. I just want to keep learning more and more and, and see what other surprises it has for me to unfold. And, and I think that's, a, that's my evolution, perhaps. Do you think you're moving away from your scientific mind? Are you open to the belief that things can be just because they are, that there doesn't have to be an explanation? I don't think so. I think I've come to a point where I'm, I'm, I'm on a beautiful intersection between that science and something, uh, something beyond, you know, science looks for proof. Science looks for validation. And as I said, you know, it, it operates from the, the body of knowledge that we already have to, to look for something you we use language to, ex, to express something, we use words, which is already part of our, our, our knowledge. But here is this something that is so out there, something so profound that, that words fail to convey, that it's, it has to just be an experience. But to get to that point, you have to make use of science. So I think it's, it's, it's a beautiful blend between you know, what we know and knowing or acknowledging the, the part of the universe that we don't know. Hmm. Do you think you need a guide to do this? properly? I think so. You do? Absolutely. You know, we have a guide for everything that we do in our lives. I had somebody who taught me math. I had somebody who taught me art. I had somebody who taught me singing and I had no problems with it, but I always question why do I need a teacher to, to, to guide me through the maze of my own mind, something that's so abstract and so subtle. So I absolutely think you need a teacher to guide you through it. Why? Because it just accelerates your progress. What type of teacher is this? If someone was going to Google a spiritual advisor, a spirit, what, what, what would we Google? <laughs> I think I would start with a, with, a, with a practice. And I think a practice leads to a teacher. I, I did not... I did not find a teacher first. I found the practice. And as I got entrenched and I got deeper into the practice, um, I looked to what more was there on this path. And then I looked up to the, the teacher who conceived this practice, who cognized this practice. And then I kind of wanted to learn more about him, how he came up with this, what was his you know, method to this madness. How did he end up with all this? Um, and, and, and then I kind of kept moving towards more of that. Um, so I think everybody's has a unique journey. Um, mm -hmm. I, 
a teacher is someone, a real spiritual master is someone who can, who can guide you where, where Google stops. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> he, he will have answers to the questions that definitely Google can't answer, such is my experience. Mm-hmm. So you've had success on Wall Street in business, in entrepreneurship, in penning your first successful book. What comes next for you? I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for it to unfold. I'm, I'm enjoying this moment. I'm, I'm enjoying talking to you right now. I'm, and I'm, I hope that, uh, that people would be able to resonate with my story. I'm looking forward to you know, connecting with them, making new friendships, and I'm sure it will open new doors and, mm-hmm. and it'll carry me to my next pursuit. <laughs> Well, I'm sure it will. I congratulate you on on everything. I'm waiting for the franchise of your artisanal chocolate place to come to Toronto here. We're a logical expansion place, aren't we? Right? To go international, we're a logical (laughs) expansion place. So you have to keep us up when that happens. Um, When is your book released and where can we um, get a copy for ourselves? Um, It's it's available for pre-sale right now for pre-order on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles. Um, You can just pre-order right now and it should um, hit the bookshelves very soon. Um, Of course, the COVID had made made some things more challenging than the others. But yes, it's available right now um, and soon to come to a bookstore near you. But Amazon is where you can pick it up from right now. It's called On a Wing and a Prayer. you can even find the link to it on my website, uh, kushalchoksi.com, my first name and last name.com. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear from you, how you like it, um, what your thoughts are when you, uh, when you get a little peek into my journey. <laughs> Well, I can't wait to read it. Um, And definitely we will have all of your contact information available to everybody after the show airs. I want to tell you what a pleasure it has been to meet you, to speak with you. And uh, again, thank you so much for taking, taking time out of your busy book touring schedule. We really do appreciate it. I know that our listeners will benefit so much uh, from your experiences. And I hope uh, everybody that you can go out and grab uh, a copy of the book because I think it's going to be impactful. Uh, We all had our own experiences with 9-11. Kushels was was there at the time. and, And, you know, because of this, we always try and find something to pull out of tragedy. And this is one, one piece that maybe that we can look to as something that has, has come out of tragedy. So thank you for this, Kushal. Thank you for being with us. Um, I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. And everybody, we will talk to you next week on The Health Hub. Health Hub, hosted by Kathy Biasi, here on Radio Maria Canada.